Hello everyone, you are here in our channel that is Best Notes Tutorials and uh, I am here with MCQs on different topics which is from literature and uh, till now we have done many MCQs. I hope you all will find it useful for your examination. So we will move towards today's video. Let's start. Question number one. Which servant in teeming of the shrew disguised himself as his master at his master's behest? Here your options are Grumio, Biodelo, Trenio and Gremio. So here your answer is option C that is Trenio. See friends we are not going into who is who and uh, why they have disguised and all those things it is because we have mentioned everything in the summary of the text so here when we are discussing mcqs we are not going to explain everything so please read the summary in order this is just revision of the text okay so please go through the text and then you will be able to relate these answers to them let's move ahead Tranio played the clever servant, disguising himself to obtain permission to marry from Bianca's father. Question number two. Which shooter to Bianca disguised himself as a music teacher? Option A. Lucentio. Option B. Hortensio. Option C. Trenio. Option D. Vincentio. So here your option B is correct that is Hortensio. Hortensio disguised himself as a music teacher to marry Bianca. Hortensio tried to teach both Bianca and Kate the lute but Kate broke the lute over his head. Question number three. Which Suter to Bianca disguised himself as a scholar and tutor of languages. Option A. Hortensio. Option B. Vincentio. Option C. Trenio. And option D. Lucentio. So here option D is correct that is Lucentio. Lucentio disguised himself as a scholar and tutor of languages. Let's see the highlighters. Lucentio truly was a scholar, but he disguised himself to get access to Bianca and woo her. Question number four. Who was the only suitor to Bianca who did not disguise himself in order to either woo her or her father? Option A. Trenio. Option B. Hortensio. Option C. Lucentio. And option D. Gremio. So here it is option D which is correct that is Gremio. Gremio was real and he did not disguise himself in order to woo her or her father. Gremio never disguised himself but he did present Lucentio to Bianca's father unaware that Lucentio disguised as Cambio was planning to win Bianca for himself. Question number 5. Trenio and Biondello are anxious to find a father for the false Lucentio. Whom do they convince to pretend he is Vincentio, Lucentio's father? Option A. The page. Option B. Petruccio. Option B. Option C. The pedant. And option D. Sly. So here it is option C which is correct, the pedant. The pedant was convinced to be the father of Lucentio. Let's see the highlighters. Trenio and Biondello tell the pedant his life is at risk for coming to Padua but that they will save him if he pretends to be Lucentio's father. Kate, in an effort to prove she will not cross her husband anymore, 
surprises a traveller by calling the character a fair young maiden. Who is this character? Option A. Lucentio. Option B. The widow. Option C. Bianca. And option D. Vincentio. Here, Vincentio is correct, which is option D. Kate and Petruccio meet the right Vincentio on the road to Padua to attend Bianca's wedding. He at first thinks they are mad as Kate, at her husband's command, calls him first a young maid, then an old man. Question number seven. One of the disguised suitors exceeds in winning Bianca's hand in marriage. What was the suitors disguised as? Option A. A merchant. Option B. His master. Option C. A scholar. And option D. A music teacher. So here, option C is correct. That is, a scholar. Lucentio, disguised as a scholar, runs off and marries Bianca while Trenio is distracting her father. Let's move to question number 8. Who presents Hortensio in disguise to Kate and Bianca's father? Option A. Grumio. Option B. Trenio. Option C. Gremio. And option D. Truccio. Here, option D is correct. That is, Petruccio. Highlighter says, Petruccio offers Hortensio's services as a gift to open the passage to woo Kate. Question number 9. Which disguised character manages to trick another one of the suitors into forswearing Bianca's love because she is being sweet with someone else? Option A. Cambio, option B, Lucentio, option C, Hortensio, and option D, Trenio. So here, option D is correct, that is Trenio. Highlighter, Trenio, disguised as Lucentio, arranges for Hortensio to spot Bianca kissing the real Lucentio in his disguised as, in his disguise as, Cambio. Hortensio and Trenio then swear off the wooing of Bianca. Question number 10. The action of the teeming of Shrew begins with a lively, none too polite altercation between one Christopher Sly and the landlady of a tavern otherwise known as the hostress. What manners of man is sly? Option A. A simple-minded Lincolnshire Shefford. Option B. A tight-fisted Yorkshire tailor. Option C. A sleazy London lawyer. Option D. A drunken war Wickshire Tinker. Here, option D is correct. That is, a drunken war Wickshire Tinker. Let's see the highlighters. It sometimes feels as though Shakespeare wrote this play, including its contentious title, primarily in order to offend the sensibilities of the 20th century politically correct brigade. Right at the outset, Sly describes himself as a tinker, not entirely a safe word to use in our own time, and even worse, as we learn from the scholar G. R. Hibbard, in Shakespeare's time at least the distinction between beggars and tinkers was not a very sharp one, and both were proverbially noted for their fondness for ale. This apparently congenital, congenital drunkard from the laboring classes is one of those type Shakespeare 
may be assumed often enough to have encountered at first hand in his native work wickshire but on the place he usually renders them in his place with human warmth discovered having seen off the hostess in a drunken stupor by an aristocratic hunting party sly is abducted by a whimsical lord and his servants dressed in rich clothes and persuaded that he is himself an aristocrat that a servant boy is dragged is that beautiful wife and that a quiet lengthy play the taming of the shrew is about to be performed specially for his benefit in this way the main drama is framed and effectively distanced from our everyday lives the editor of the new cambridge edition invoking the notion of comedy as a kind of therapy maintains that sly can be seen by us as a kind of lord of misrule presiding over a brief period of holiday from everyday conventions let's move to question number 11 before telling sly about the play they are going to put on the lord and his serving men invite him to look at some of their most beautiful wanton pictures in order to tempt him what do they say is the object matters of these pictures option a portraits of great italian princes and dukes option b scenes from ancient roman mythology option c scenes from the arabian nights option d venetian argosies laden with silks and spices so here option b is correct that it scenes from ancient roman mythology babbling on about marian hackett the fat ale wife of wincot according to some scholars probably a real life war wickshire acquaintance of the young shakespeare's sly is far too drunk to register an interest in the idea of looking at the lord's art collection but the pictures are likely enough described and the spirit of comedy is never far away still there is a serious element in these pictures which since shakespeare did not forget that there were intellectuals in the galleries looking for cerebral stimulations as well as groundlings standing in the open air pit in front of the stage content with rudder with ruder pleasures we can easily enough relate to certain themes in the ensuing play that is about to be presented the three classical subjects mentioned as portrayed in the pictures are those of venus and adonis jupiter and o and the one most graphically described let's move to question number 12 the main drama begins without further ado as if for sly's benefit and the persons of a young italian from pisa lucentio and his servant trenio appear on a stage to which city in lombardy seat of learning and center of aristotelian teaching has lucentio come as he says to deck his fortune with his virtuous deeds option a brescia option b vicenza option c milan and option d padua here option d is correct that is padua lucentio's reference in his opening speech to fair padua nursery of arts is historically correct the town which also traditionally claimed to be the most ancient of all north italian cities boasts the 
second oldest university in Italy, founded in 19, sorry, 1222, and which for 18 years that coincided, coincided amongst exactly, almost exactly, with the most intense period of Shakespeare's writing career, employed Galileo Galilei no less as a lecturer. Shakespeare was evidently well aware of his impressively august background to his distinctly irreverent and often slapstick farcical drama. Question number 13. The action continues. What is the name of the stock Venetian pantaloons, one of the suitors now on a stage who wishes to marry the beautiful Bianca, Baptista's younger daughter? Option A, Grumio. Option B, Drumio. Option C, Gremio. And option D, Gromio. Here it is option C which is correct, that is Gremio. Venetians will no doubt have been a common sight in 16th century Padua since the town had been part of Venice territory for 200 years and was to remain so for another 200. But it was the figure of the stereotypical Venetian pantaloon that Shakespeare must have known his audience would most relish. This absurd figure, although in Shakespeare even he is not a complete caricature, he is given a few human touches, one to marry, wants to marry the beautiful and much sought after young heiress Bianca, Baptista's daughter. He already has one declared rival, the much younger Sprintlier. Sprintlier and apparently more eligible man about town, Hortensio, but as we watch the scene, another rival appears before our eyes in the person of the newly arrived visitor Lucentio, who falls for Bianca's charms at first sight. Question number 14. From Verona, there next arrives on a stage with his servant, the dashing young gallant Petruccio, whose first action in town is to look up his old Paduan friend Hortensio, to whom he confides his intentions to find a wife as soon as possible. What kind of wife is Petruccio specifically looking for? Option A. A quiet one. Option B, a beautiful one. Option C, a wealthy one. And option D, an intellectual one. So here, option C is correct. That is, a wealthy one. Petruccio has just inherited his father's estate and is evidently eager to find as quickly as possible a suitably well-connected and well-off wife who can help him to run it. Hortensio opens his front door to find his old friend indulging in a slapstick routine with his obstreperous servant, Grumio, which culminates in the master wringing the wretched servant violently by the ears. Having restored calm and discovered Petruccio's matrimonial intentions, Hortensio half-jokingly informs him of an eligible young woman with wealth enough and young and beauteous brought up as best becomes a gentlewoman, but intolerable crushed with a screwish tongue. Clearly a man to relish a challenge, Petruccio asks her father's name and discovers it is none other than Minola, an old acquaintance of his late father's. He decides immediately to go and find him, 
with Hortensio accompanying him in order to try his luck with Bianca disguised as a music teacher. Petruccio providing him with an introduction and recommendation to her father. Question number 15. Let's break the narrative here to introduce a bit of a stage history. Which distinguished Shakespearean actor notorious for the liberties he took with the Bard's text is credited with first appearing on a stage as Petruccio brandishing a whip as if to indicate that his taming techniques could take a very nasty turn if necessary. Option A. John Philip Campbell. Option B. David Garrick. Option C. Peter O'Toole. Option D. Jonathan Price. So here, option B is correct, that is David Garrick. By all accounts, Garrick was one of the most electrifying actors of all time. And perhaps we shouldn't criticize him for adapting and sometimes rewriting the Bard's precious texts or for introducing his own gimmicks and props to every performance. This is the kind of thing which directors and perhaps especially actor-directors have always done. Petruccio's whip, as it happens, as a, was a remarkably popular innovation with audiences and with actors and directors too. Andrew Dixon, in the Rough Guide to Shakespeare, informs us that the prop would remain obligatory well into the 20th century. Question number 16. To return to the action, what is the missing word in the rhetorical question Petruccio asks by way of replying to, whose, to those who think his matrimonial intentions are mad and do you tell me of a woman's dash that gives not half so great a blow to here as will a chestnut in a farmer's fire. Option A. Voice. Option B. Lip. Option C. Tongue. And option D. Tear. So here it is tongue. And do you tell me of a woman's tongue that gives not half so great a blow to here as will a chestnut to a farmer's Fire. A Shakespearean character is created first and foremost by the kind of language he speaks and from the start Petruccio's hints at a kind of lyrical vitality that the other personages in the play can hardly match. Such wind as scatters young men through the world to seek their fortunes farther than at home, for instance. Question number 17. As the first tutoring sessions begin in Baptista Minola's house, what does Katharina do to Hortensio, her new music teacher? Option A. She breaks his drum over his head. She breaks his bass while against his legs. Option C. She makes him choke on his recorder. Option D. She hits him over the head with his lute. So option D is correct. That is, she hits him over the head with his lute. Let's see the highlighters. The arrival of a motley crew of suitors at Minola's house is preceded by a second brief cameo glimpse of Katharina's characteristic behavior as having tied her younger sister's hands, she tries to bully her into revealing the name of her favorite suitor and ends up slapping her just as she, as her father enters the room in time to untie Bianca's hands 
and send her away out of immediate danger. Let's see the question number 18. Let me read these lines at first. Like a good businessman, Baptista now sets about the marrying off of his younger daughter, Bianca, and invites Trenio, still posing as Lucentio, and the old pantaloon to bid her bid for her as at an auction. What is the result of the bidding? Option A. Baptista cancels the bidding because he wants to include the absent Hortensio in it as well. Option B. The pantaloon wins because he is wealthier than Lucentio. Option C. Trenio wins provided his father can guarantee his offer. Option D. Neither of them bid enough to satisfy Bianca's greedy father. Here, option C is correct, that is, Trenio wins provided his father can guarantee his offer. The attitude of all three men on stage to the process of bidding for Bianca appears to reduce the statue, sorry, status of the prospective young bright to that of a fine looking beast in a cattle market although the hyperbole of the whole scene encourages us to enjoy the rich comedy of the occasion rather than to reflect on more serious issues related to the treatment of women the american critic maynard mack suggests that in this hilarious scene the enormous traffic in Uresis in the 1590s is being spoofed and also recalls a modern production he once saw in which he, bidded, he bidding has reached such dizzy heights that Baptista's computer blows up. In the excitement, in the excitement of the moment, both suitors seriously risk exhausting their credit in Max summary. Gremio bids for Bianca with an Argosi and Trenio Lucentio replies with a whole merchant fleet plus its escort. Having silenced his rival with his spurious munificence, Trenio now suddenly bethinks himself that he will have to find a fake father to guarantee his offer. Otherwise, the lovely Bianca will never revert to the old pantaloon Gremio by default. Question number 19. Katharina's wedding day arrives. In the street before her father's house, her prospective bridegrooms is eagerly awaited by all. When Petruccio arrives, which one of these statements is not true of them of him option a he is impatient to be married option b he is dressed very unsuitably option c he is unapologetically late and option d he is paralytically drunk so here option d is correct that is he is paralytically drunk Petruccio arrives as boisterous and energetic as ever, certainly as far from paralytic as it is possible to be, but very scruffily dressed and extremely late. Katharina has been reduced to tears by the thought that, after all, the excitement of a sudden marriage, she is going to be stood up after all and... Bapista has also betrays his nervousness, but after his initial relief at seeing the bridegroom, he expresses disgust with his wildly inappropriate dress sense. Petruccio, however, dismisses these objections. To me, she is married, he says, 
not unto my clothes and rushes off to find his lovely bride and take her off to church with him with no further delay question number 20 winter sets in on the stage as petruchio and katharina makes for the countryside after an extremely punishing journey they arrive hungry and ti- tired at petruchio's home and are welcomed by his servants in this scene and the ones which follow what does petruchio not deprive katharina of option a food option b his company in bed option c his new clothes option d sleep here option b is correct that is his company in bed the arduous journey through the cold and muddy italian countryside is described to the home based servant curtis by grumio who has been sent on ahead to ensure that everything is in order by the time his master and mistress arrive the tale of the journey is told in grumio's distinctively humorous fashion and the interchange with Curtis inevitably involves a boxing of the latter's ears for good measure there are many servants on call and the house organization appears to be excellent but when petruchio arrives with his exhausted bride he is clearly in a mood to find fault with every thing when supper is brought in he pretends it is burnt and dry and holds both dishes and food at his bewildered menial heedless of katharina's protests question number 21 thou thread thou timble thou yard three quarters half yard quarter nail thou flee thou knit thou winter cricket thou who is on the receiving end of this wonderful tirade of abuse from petruchio on the morning after the latter's arrival home with his bride option a a tailor option b a haberdasher option c a female relative and option d a liveried servant option a is correct here that is a tailor a tailor receives these words from Petruchio The scene involving a tailor and a haberdasher comes the following morning after Katharina has been cheated for cheated of breakfast first by Grumio's in sufferable clothing and cloning and then by Petruchio's appeal to his perennial sidekick hortensio to eat everything up before the lady can get it too one can well imagine shakespeare's groundling groundling's hooting with delight at the following episode involving the poor tailor whose role turns out to be one of the public humiliation by petruchio the scene is played out with such loving intention to detail that one guesses tailors must have been fair game for an elizabethan audience as they undoubtedly were let later in 19th century english folklore katharina likes the cap offered to her by the haberdasher very much but her husband insists that it was molded on a poringo and dismisses the man whereupon it is the tailor's turn question number 22 on meeting a traveler from mantua in the street near baptista minola's home what barefaced lie does trenio tell him option e that strangers from mantua discovered in town will be put to death option b 
that Baptista Minola is looking for a wealthy merchant to marry his daughter. Option C. The stranger carrying money bill from Florence will be put to death. And option D. That he must change his identity with Trenio because Trenio is fleeing from the law. Here, option A is very correct. That is, this, that strangers from Mantua discovered in town will be put to death. Highlighter says, this new character who appears to be Mantuan merchant, although for some reason he is referred to throughout as a pedant in the folio speech headings, has been spotted by Bayon Delo as a gullible looking fool who can easily be persuaded by Trenio to impersonate Lucentio's father in order to sign Bianca's marriage contract and vouch for the staggering offer made for a hand by Trenio on Lucentio's behalf. Trenio says H.B. Charlton is a street from Plutus and from Terence, still practicing his customary role of beguiling the old folks in the interests of their Amorous son and daughters. Question number 23. What do Petruccio and Katharina argue about as they make their way back through his countryside en route to Bianca's wedding celebration? Option A. The time of day. Option B. The courses of the planets. Option C. The sun and the moon. Option D. The seasons of the year. Here, Option C is correct, the sun and the moon. Highlighters They had argued previously about the time of day before setting out, with Petruccio refusing to start the journey until his wife stopped contradicting him when he made ludicrous assertions about it. Now, seeing the sun, he calls it the moon and when Katrina, Katharina cannot restrain herself from contradicting him again, he threatens to call the horses back and return home. Let's move to question number 24. After the off-stage marriage feast at Baptista's, a wedding banquet at Lucentio's place gets underway. Paduan hospitality was evidently on a generous scale. Possibly fortified by wine, the three new husbands each wager a hundred crowns on their respective wives' obedience towards them. Who wins the wager? Option A. Hortensio. Option B. Petruccio. Option C. Lucentio. And Option D. None of them. So here it is Petruccio. Petruccio, who would fain be doing, is quick to complain about the sudden dullness of inaction around the place. Nothing but sit and sit and eat and eat. But he soon perks up when his own wife and Hortensio's FST video start metaphorically sharpening their claw on each other. These two eventually exit in Bianca's company, whereupon the idea of a wager is brought up. The three husbands will each in turn summon their wives to return to the table, and the winner will be one whose command is obeyed first. Bayandello is sent in turn to summon Bianca and the widow, but they both refuse to come when requested, and we may feel that their independence spirit is justified and augurs well for their future as wives with a realistic say in their husband's behavior. Grumio is then dispatched to command Rina and 
she appears immediately thereby winning the wager for her husband she is ordered peremptorily by her husband to fetch in the other two ladies which she obediently does from this moment it seems to me that shakespeare's wife taming story becomes distinctly murky as the witty young woman of previous scenes is suddenly transmogrified into the intoner of a dull humorless homily to the greater glory of husbands everywhere question number 25 shakespeare's fellow playwright john fletcher wrote in the early 17th century a sequel to taming of the shrew in which after katharina's death a second wife finally gets the better of petruchio what is not a reason what is not a reasonable hypothesis to make it in light of this fact your options are option a that shakespeare's play had stirred up a hornet nest to controversy option b that fletcher thought he was a better writer than shakespeare option c that attitudes towards the abuse of women were changing in shakespeare's lifetime option d that plays about sexual politics were good box office draws here option b is correct that is that fledger thought he was a better writer than shakespeare highlighter says professor park believes that shakespeare in this the shrew opens a pandora's box and his view of his materials is ambiguous and unresolved honan thinks that the bard as he wrote his play was in two minds about the morality of men's ownership of women but whether or not this is the case it is evident that fledger shakespeare's sometime collaborator in henry viii and the two noble kinsmen wanted to steer a different course in his ostensibly more women friendly sequel the women's prize or the tamo tamed in which an older petruchio now a widower remarries and is given a hefty taste of his own violent medicine by his second wife g r hebard remarks that the appearance of fledger's play is not only a testimony to the popularity of shakespeare's but also adds weight to the view that the taming of the shrew was among other things a contribution to the great debate about women and marriage question number 26 which distinguished irish playwright well known for his willingness to castigate the many faults he thought he had discovered in shakespeare as a man and dramatist characterized katharina's long final speech in the taming of the shrew as one vile insult to womanhood and manhood from the first word first word to the last options are option a william butler yeats or w b w yeats option b bendan behan option c george bernard shaw and option d seen o casing here it is option c that is george bernard shaw no man with any decency no man with any decency of feeling shaw added for good measure can sit it out in the company of a woman without being extremely ashamed of the lord of creation moral implied in the wager and the speech put into the woman's own mouth the play and its ending have been quite 
stoutly defended in other quarters though by women critic as well as by men by this we have completed mcqs of day 25th we will meet in our other videos till now we have completed so many videos so please revise it according to your schedule we will meet soon till then take care and all the best for your upcoming examinations from our channel's side